Welcome to Pipeline Conversations, a machine learning podcast by ZenML. Welcome back to another episode of Pipeline Conversations. In this episode, I'm really happy to be able to continue the dialogue we've been having with our users and community around the role of annotation in MLOps. We were really lucky to get to talk to Eva Gumnishka, the founder of Humans in the Loop. They're an organization that provides data annotation and collection services. Their teams are primarily made up of those who have been affected by conflict and now are asylum seekers or refugees. Eva has a ton of experience working with annotation and has seen how different companies build this into their production machine learning life cycles. We're continuing to work on a feature that will allow you to do this as part of your MLOps workflow when using ZenML. And I welcome any feedback you might have on the back of this podcast or the articles that we've been publishing on the ZenML blog. Please do drop into our Slack community or drop me an email at podcast at zenml.io. Sure. So I come from a human rights background. Uh, social causes have always been a big interest of mine, and I've always looked for a bigger meaning and you know a way in which I can make an impact on people. Of course, that's a very questionable pursuit. I mean, maybe you know you can say that it's a very colonial one when it comes to international development. But in any case, I've been engaging a lot with these topics. Um, and after I graduated. I created Humans in the Loop uh, back in Bulgaria, where I'm from and where I'm based right now, uh, with the entire idea to generate employment opportunities for refugees and conflict-affected people. Uh, and we ended up in data annotation just because we saw that there is this new interesting niche. It's an easy type of work that uh, can create a lot of new opportunities for people. Um, so for me, I didn't come from any type of technical background. Uh, it was mostly the promise of, of this technology and, and the promise of the market uh, to create more labor opportunities for people. Of course, by now, it's actually created more uh, opportunities for exploitation than of actual opportunity. So again, you know, there are a lot of issues in the entire industry of data labeling, data annotation, uh, but we're trying to do our best. We're trying to generate opportunities where there are currently none. We're active in a lot of uh, countries and Middle that usually do not have access to digital uh, freelance platforms or digital remote work opportunities or uh, payments like PayPal and so on. Uh, so we're trying to create more opportunities there. Uh, and we're, of course, trying to serve our clients who are uh, some of the most interesting companies working on computer vision solutions for different types of industries like medical AI, retail, automotive, uh, geospatial, agricultural. Um, and we're trying to do our best to, to serve them and to find new ways in which our humans can bring a benefit to them and uh, to their AI systems. Great, thank you. We'll get on to the, to the annotation bit, but before we get there, I just want to ask you, because it's very rare in this world that I get to talk to someone who's been studying and been involved in humanities and so on, and human rights, as, as you mentioned earlier, like what have you had any interesting insights or crossovers or things that you've brought with you into the into this world from from your previous studies yeah absolutely i would say that um, what maybe even distinguishes me particularly as an entrepreneur and from or and even us as an organization is that we work very very closely with academia because i know that a lot of interesting research is happening there especially on the societal effects of ai responsible ai ethical ai um, AI and the labor market, all of that. And, you know, for me, it has been very important for us to work together with researchers. So we've been doing a lot of uh, joint work with different uh, researchers from uh, yeah, academia, uh, mostly in the field of responsible AI, but also because I see ourselves as a vehicle to actually take that research and put it into practice. So we've been trying to adopt, for example, documentation for the data sets that we've been working on as a good practice that, you know, people in academia have been proposing for a while. Uh, we have our own like ethical AI policy that's informed by a lot of that research. So I would say that, yeah, just coming from uh, this type of background has enabled me to uh, maybe just, yeah, see the value of that research in social sciences and 
um, all of the complexity of the work that we do and, and adopt also a critical mindset in terms of like the, the systems that we're building together. Um, so yeah, uh, it's been, I would say it's definitely a value add because all of the hard technical skills you can learn, you can hire people that can help you, but the critical mindset uh, is something that is definitely very, very useful. Yeah, for sure. And having taken a little kind of overview look around this space recently, it's definitely, I would say, something that distinguishes you or your organization from there are lots of or there are at least a few other organizations that are doing something similar to what you're doing, but in, I don't know, in a much more like ethically unclear way, for sure. Yeah, I mean, it's it's great that there is such a trend and, you know, the impact sourcing idea and initiative uh, has been around for a while and there are a lot of companies that are trying to create opportunities uh, for people around the world and that's great and, you know, we, we need to all be working together, of course. Um, but, of course, also the, the impact sourcing momentum has kind of slowed down. Uh, now there is a much bigger focus on ESG and maybe, you know, diversity in procurement and not so much on the impact that you're creating in terms of your uh, sourcing activities. Um, but yeah, I would say that we're we're always remaining very critical of the impact that we're doing on the ground, whether the work that we provide is actually beneficial or maybe it's not beneficial at all. Uh, so, you know, we're doing our best, even though there are a lot of pending uh, questions and, and things to uh, resolve. Mm. So could you just talk us through a little bit about the kind of where you sit in the machine learning life cycle, where you've been working, where you felt like have been the most interesting places where the kind of the annotation process fits in? Sure. Yeah. So currently a lot of the industry is focused on the annotation that happens on the training data before you start training your models. This is where a lot of the inquiries that we get are still coming from. A lot of companies are still at that stage where they're collecting their training data. If they have too much data, they're trying to curate it and they're trying to annotate it. So a lot of them, may, especially in the early stages, because we work with a lot of startups, they may be changing their taxonomy. They may be trying to define, okay, what classes do we want to label? How do we want to label them and so on? So this is where we come in very frequently and we just annotate that seed training data set that companies are using. There are also some companies that maybe have a pre-trained model. They're trying to optimize and automate a lot of that process. So they just want us to validate the results of, of some type of pre-annotation that they're doing on their end. So that's another stage that after there is some kind of a, a basic model that they've trained, we can come in and just validate those outputs. Very frequently, this can save time and effort, but sometimes it can also create additional effort because if the pre-annotations are really bad, what we have to do is actually take even more time to correct them and then submit the data. So sometimes companies think that, you know, pre-annotation can save them a lot of money, but it actually creates more work for companies like us. So it really has to be, you know, if you're trying to do pre-annotation, your model has to be quite good. And then once the model is in deployment, we are working with some companies in order to provide live monitoring of their systems. Frequently, these are high risk systems that require an additional like second layer of human monitoring and auditing. And for some of them, we're actually looking at live streams of data in order to correct the model responses in real time and also handle alerts in real time. So this is a, a new type of service that we're exploring currently, and it's something that's really promising for us. And I'm very excited about this because it also guarantees more reliability and trustworthiness of these systems. And I'm trying to also promote it as a best practice especially for high-risk systems. And then, of course, there is the post-deployment, let's say, auditing of these models. We're not doing enough of that yet, but I think a lot of companies may still be just trying to figure out their entire pipeline and how to create this continuous deployment, continuous training, and continuous auditing and improvement of their models through this type of annotation. So essentially, that would mean that we verify the model's responses, even if it's not in real time. Maybe just some of that data that we generate is used to retrain the model and to improve it for the future. So these are kind of the, the different stages across the, the entire life cycle where we can be plugged in. It's 
maybe kind of legacy use cases of annotation, people consider it to be just, you know, get our initial starter day set set and then we can take it from there. But what you are kind of saying is it really needs to be considered across the whole life cycle as something kind of integral to all of the different pieces. Exactly, especially for cases that are being deployed in the wild, let's say. So when you may be coming across a lot of different edge cases and maybe your model is, is working in a high risk environment, maybe for some you know, quite simple models that are just, you know, positioned like one camera in a factory setting, and it's not going to see much more than the same type of like metal objects that are being manufactured or something. In that case, it's perfectly fine not to have this continuous deployment and integration of, the, of your system and continuous monitoring. Uh, but for a lot of cases where your model is interacting with real humans, and maybe they're going to be acting in unexpected ways, there's going to be the need of other humans on the back end to actually make sense of all of that new data. And as a as an industry or as a, as a discipline, like how do you go about thinking about like best practices? Who is driving that forward? Are there discussions around how to do this? Is it very still early stages? Yeah. Um, I would say it's very early stages. Definitely a lot of the big influencers in the field, maybe, uh, you know, people like Andrew Ng that have a big audience and a wide reach of people. I would say that these are some of the key people that are promoting new modes of thinking, like, you know, this entire idea of data centric AI. Um, and it's great because you see it immediately being adopted by a lot of practitioners in the field. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know how many uh, researchers have that reach and, and the ability to influence practitioners, but there are definitely some people in the industry that are key in promoting, you know, these new ideas. Um, and I would say we have definitely seen both startups and big corporations think very critically about their ways of collecting data, annotating data. Some of them really want to do the right thing, especially when it comes to maybe protected attributes and making sure that your model is not discriminating against people. So there are some companies and uh, both small and big that are trying to uh, consider all of the available research, all of the available you know, best practices they're seeing maybe other companies do um, in order to create models that are trustworthy. But we've also seen the opposite where the company just wants to you know, get their data, train a model and, and really doesn't care. Uh, so I would say in the second case, there is going to be the need for regulation in order to make sure that all companies are, are compliant. Um, so also, I would say regulation now, especially in Europe, is going to play a major role. Uh, presumably, though, you have just by the fact that you've been involved in a bunch of different use cases and experiences with different kinds of companies, you've generated your or you've kind of you have a feeling for like where you think things should be going. Maybe you could share some of what the core the core kind of foundations of annotation and so on and what you do are? Yeah, well, I would say it's actually very interesting, the position that we're in, because we're able to see what companies are working on that maybe will be launched, you know, six months in the future. Uh, so we have this kind of like an insider view. Um, and I would say that uh, a lot of companies are working on very complex use cases. Uh, so we almost are not seeing any cases where we have to label cats and dogs anymore uh, because there are a lot of uh, available trained models. There are a lot of available data sets. What companies are working on right now are non-trivial problems where there is a lack of data. Uh, the taxonomy is very complex. We're working on projects with more than 100 classes where the labelers really have to develop an expertise. Um, you, you know, you really need subject matter experts for a lot of these uh, labeling projects, but you also need them to be scalable. So a lot of companies are facing this uh, issue that, for example, for a medical AI project, they need to hire radiologists, but they're so expensive. So how do you even scale that effort uh, if, you know, even one image or one case takes up so much of your time? Uh, so I would say that this is this is a big bottleneck for a lot of companies, just the difficulty of the labeling and finding the right workforce for it. Uh, because even in our case, you know, we do have a medical annotation uh, team, so that's great. You know, we're able to support companies there, but some companies are looking for botanists or maybe people with an architectural degree. Just you know, depending on on the type of use case. 
Um, and they really have to invest a lot in, in these subject matter experts to prepare their data and to validate it in the future as well as the model is being trained. So um, I would say that this is a big trend that I'm seeing right now. Are there ways or are you experimenting with ways of using less expert subject matter experts or upskilling people so that they can become that for the specific domain to solve that problem? Yeah, absolutely. So this is a, a very frequent approach that we have where we have one subject matter expert who trains the people. And of course, even though some of these cases may be quite complex, if, if they are restrained to a particular maybe set of 10 classes with en enough examples of each class, uh, people even without uh, a university degree can learn how to do it. Um, I remember we we're working on one project um, which is related to um, segmenting different types of chemical probes with their sediment, their liquids, and so on. And it's quite complex. Um, but we have a team that has been working on this for a while now. And one of the researchers uh, was doing shadowing with one of the annotators. And she was amazed, you know, because this is a woman who doesn't speak English. She has a high school degree, but she's still, you know, she's able to perform this really complex labeling on the different probes with the, you know, particular classes and so on. Um, so people are definitely able to learn. Um, but of course, sometimes, for example, for medical projects, you need board certified radiologists. So you just need that certification of the annotators, no matter uh, you know, whether you're able to train uh, non-qualified uh, people, uh, you just need that certification in order to prove that your system has been trained only by board certified radiologists. So this is sometimes you know, the, a barrier that we're facing you're not able maybe maybe to like pre-select images or pre-annotate things with a non-certified team and then just allow the board certified people to be quick in how they yeah yeah this is this is an approach that uh we're taking some time and and companies even usually may have two different labeling partners one of them could be with the general skilled workforce that does the basic things and then another partner with just the experts. Uh, so there are a lot of ways to yeah, think about this and to maybe divide the, the, the data across different levels of, of quality control and, and so on. Um, so you've mainly, we've mainly been talking about kind of computer vision examples. What are the kind of common areas where you find people are doing annotation? Um, a very interesting uh, example would be uh, recycling and uh, trash segmentation, just because, uh, of course, it's really relevant right now in order to reduce waste uh, in general globally uh, and to be able to recycle more materials. But very frequently, the challenge is having human workers do that manual work of uh, for example, picking and, and dividing the trash in different piles. So there are a lot of new companies doing very interesting solutions, both on an industrial scale and uh, just for home-based uh, recycling bins on how to uh, distinguish and, and um, uh, redirect different types of trash towards different piles. So this has been a very interesting use case that we've been seeing uh, for a long time. Uh, another very common use case is uh, for insure tech companies to be able to detect car damages. Um, and that's also quite interesting because it does have a geographic component to it. So it depends where you're planning to deploy your AI in mm -hmm. terms of knowing what types of company, uh, what, what right. types of cars uh, you need to use it on and what where do you need to collect the data? Uh, because of course the cars that we have here in Bulgaria are quite different from the cars in the US, sure. for example, or in Japan. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I would say there are a lot of interesting, very, very practical use cases uh, in computer vision. I'm not very sure about NLP or other types of machine learning because we are not very active there. Um, but in terms of computer vision, there are a lot of new exciting applications. Interesting. And I guess one of the big decisions a company who had a very big, like strong need for annotation needs to decide is whether to do things in-house or with an external partner. 
I'm be interested in kind of what the trade-offs are there and like when might it be appropriate versus not for people because you know i think most famously tesla used to outsource their data and then they brought it in-house because they thought it was so much more important um yeah of course yeah and i think now they have around a thousand people hired full-time internally so it's really impressive but uh, absolutely. I think that the the more important the annotation process is, the more um, th there is value in bringing it in-house if you're able to, of course, pay all of these people. Um, just because very frequently, especially when companies are only using annotation for the first stage, for the model training data stage, um, afterwards, you know, you're going through the the rest of, you know, just like working with the model and, and testing it and so on and all of the annotators may be sitting idle without any work until you're able to like send them more work to either like validate or annotate new examples. Um, so for a lot of companies, it doesn't make a lot of sense to maintain an in-house team um, just because you have to be keep, keeping them entertained um, or at least, you know, to make sure their time is worthwhile. A lot of companies are using just freelancers that are they are able to to call up whenever there is new annotation work. Um, but of course, there you have a lot of that people management effort that a lot of companies are just trying to save up. So I would say the biggest reasons and, and you know the factors for someone to use an outsource provider is, for example, if their supply of, of data annotation work is not very uh, constant. Maybe they have like big bursts and then they have nothing. So in those cases, it's much better to work with a partner like us just because we can scale up and down. And, you know, even if we don't have any work from you for like three months in a row, it's fine. Uh, you don't have to pay us for like a retainer or anything else. Uh, we're just there on hold. And whenever you have like a million images that you need to process in a month, we're, we're also going to be there. Um, so that's one of the things. And then, yeah, just the, the effort for managing that human workforce, because, you know, the human factor is always something that a lot of tech companies are trying to avoid because it's, yeah, they, they, they try to avoid just having any type of, uh, human dependency on, on humans in their systems. Yep. Um, and in those cases, it's just much easier to work with someone like us who deals with all of that hassle internally and companies just receive their data. Um, and um, yeah, I would say in terms of monitoring as well, it's gonna be, um, I would say, uh, also very difficult for us to secure clients in the space, just because a lot of these applications are high risk. Uh, a lot of them may uh, involve personal data. So in a lot of these cases, companies do prefer to use an in-house workforce, even if it's gonna be more expensive as well. Um, but, you know, for me, it's still a very interesting space and I'm looking forward to exploring it because I see a lot of value in having, you know, these teams across the globe that are monitoring AI systems and they're providing also a lot of diversity in terms of the, you know, the people that are involved in the monitoring. Um, so yeah, I think this is, this is going to be the next step for us, validating whether there is enough of a need among clients to use humans for this type of continuous monitoring. I think the point at which you have to have a lot of iteration and, you know, I would probably guess that as an industry, we're probably moving towards the place where it's just going to become more and more normal that annotation is a part of or annotation like things are just part of how we think about MLOps. And I'm actually a little bit surprised that whenever someone gives their like MLOps 101 presentation, I don't think I can remember a time where someone was talking about annotation in like a front and center way. I found that a bit weird. Yeah, I think the, the supposition is always that the data scientist would be the one to review the data and then pinpoint some edge cases and then retrain the model. And I, I guess, you know, in maybe 10 years ago, that was also the supposition for the labeling of the data. It was just that, you know, the data scientists would just label a bunch of images and use them to train their model. Um, and of course, companies have realized that this is actually so much work and it's not useful to be dedicating the hours of their really expensive data scientists for such types of menial work. And I think that they, a lot of companies may realize that 
also dedicating a data scientist to manually review a lot of the the results let's say of the outputs of the model and to find edge cases and to analyze them and so on uh this will also start becoming a job that can be outsourced soon mm -hmm. interesting and in terms of like roles do you yeah i i, I interested kind of how, how you've seen how you've seen this present out in the world to do uh, yeah, I don't even know. Is data annotator like uh, a role that one can have within a company, like a full-time thing? Is Are there standards around this? Yeah, I mean, it's quite interesting. For us, the vision is that human in the loop is going to be the job of the future. So this is going to be mm -hmm. what you're going to put on your CV. Now there mm -hmm. are definitely people who are just putting data annotator on their CVs. And um, mm -hmm. they may be working for some of these big crowdsourcing um, platforms, or maybe they're employed as a data annotator at a particular uh, company. But I definitely see this as a specialization. So for example, company, uh, people are reaching out to us and they're saying, hey, I'm, I have three years of experience as a data annotator. I've worked for this and that platform. I've worked on projects related to this and that domain. And sometimes it's quite interesting to see, oh, okay, this person has worked maybe on you know, trash segmentation. So they may actually already have seen a lot of these types of images. They may know how to perform the segmentation. So there is definitely a specialization aspect of it, uh, which is quite interesting. Um, but I would agree that in the industry, it's still a, a type of position that's underappreciated, undervalued. Sometimes it's hidden um, just because companies do not want to reveal that they're actually using humans, um, especially when their AI is still not working very well. They may be using humans at the back end just to you know, correct and, and right. uh, wipe up after their AI, which is fine. Um, and you know, this is something that I'm trying to even normalize. Uh, by saying that it's actually good, you know, it's the best practice to have these types of humans. Um, so it's not something that companies should be ashamed of. It's actually, you know, a sign of uh, you make wanting to make sure that your AI is trustworthy, that it has human oversight on top of it and so on. Um, but yeah, I would say in a lot of cases, companies are talking about data annotation as the dirty little secret of AI. And they're saying, you know, they're talking about it as if it was, um, you know, a big deal. And it's something that, uh, you know, needs to be uncovered. Like, you know, those thousand people at the Tesla offices. Well, it's just, you know, an essential part of the AI team. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Some rebranding to be done there. Mm -hmm. yeah. the, instead of the dirty <laughs> little secret, it's the shining gem or diamond. In the, yeah, yeah. yeah. And obviously a lot of these companies in perhaps in their ideal vision, they wouldn't have to deal with humans at all. And there would be like automated ways of doing like the labeling. And obviously there's a, a good deal of research at the moment, which is trying to replace the need for humans for at least parts or big chunks of, of the kind of the annotation process, or at least to kickstart it. What do you see as the core piece of the, your organization's like whole reason for existence? Like where will there always be a need for humans in the loop? Yeah, so I definitely am also seeing a big push for that because it's also more cost effective mm -hmm. and companies are always, uh, and also, you know, in, in academia as well, there's always this big push for optimization, for automation and so on. Um, but with that, there's always going to be more and more spaces created for humans, like new occupations. Um, so, for example, you know, data entry is now a thing of the past because we have all these automated OCR softwares for your invoices. Uh, but now you may need humans to actually annotate the data in order to be able to train them. Once this is automated, maybe you're going to need humans to actually validate those inputs and uh, handle all of the difficult and weird invoices that appear. Uh, or maybe even if that's automated, you're going to need humans to monitor these models and how they're performing and uh, tweak them and so on. So in any case, I think that still th there's always going to be a big need uh, for humans at different stages. And even if AI is uh, wiping out some types of, of human occupations, it's going to be creating the same amount or even more in different types of, of human occupations related to the AI industry, like maybe an AI ethicist or an AI diversity uh, monitor or advocate or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So people who are kind of more expert in the, um, yeah, just making sure that 
what you think you're doing is what you're actually doing or what you think you're getting is actually what yeah. you're getting. So we talked a lot about kind of the process, I guess. I'm interested how, yeah, how you ensure that the kind of the quality of the data labeling is is what you think. Obviously, if, if you're scaling this up, you know, you have a lot of people, a lot of people working on this. How How to think about the kind of the quality evaluation part? Yeah, the human element as well. Um, so this is always an ongoing question with a lot of our projects. Um, very frequently, it's not necessarily correcting errors that the people are making, but making sure that um, they are actually thinking about the data in the same way as the client. Because very frequently, people, whenever they sit in front of their computer, they're working in, in good faith, you know, they're doing their best, but maybe they just do not have the same understanding that our client requires. So this is where we come across this contradiction of, you know, maybe I'm labeling uh, one data set and I'm seeing, uh, I don't know, a, a, a person in a wheelchair in a scene, uh, in a traffic scene, for example. Uh, and I only have classes for human, rider, pedestrian, or whatever, you know, and there is no mention of a person in a wheelchair or mobility aids and so on. So what do I do in that case? Um, and very frequently, I just have to ask the client, what do you want me to do? Because maybe my interpretation of labeling that person as a rider or a pedestrian is not going to be in line with your expectation, or maybe you have not even thought of that edge case. Um, so uh, there was actually some interesting research on labeling instructions. Um, and uh, essentially, um, the researchers who wrote it claim that um, very frequently bias is not due to the labelers and their subjective judgment, but it's due to the subjective judgment of the people who are actually ordering the labeling service and who are creating the bounds of that project and who are giving the instructions. So, you know, usually bias in big large scale data sets, maybe um, people may say that it's due to, you know, the human element and, you know, human error and so on. But very frequently it's because of the lack of comprehensive instructions, unclear instructions, the fact that you may not have thought of every possible use case and so on. Um, so essentially we're trying to mitigate that uh, problem by establishing clear communication rules between our clients and our uh, annotators. They do not necessarily have to communicate directly, but whenever one of our annotators come across such an edge case, they are always encouraged to flag it and to mark the picture. For example, I'm unsure or there is something weird on this picture or I, I want to flag this. Um, so that gets scaled, uh, escalated up to their supervisor, to us. And then if we're unsure if, if that's not covered in the instructions, we also escalate it to the client. Uh, so it's very important to have that channel of communication because there's always going to be cases like that, that, you know, we don't know what to do about. And this is where very frequently the biggest mistakes are usually made. Um, so even if there are a lot of technical ways of using, you know, error detection and outlier detection and so on, um, very frequently it's just a matter of getting everyone on the same page and making sure they have the same understanding and interpretation of the data. Also among different annotators, because maybe for the trash segmentation piece, um, they all understand the data, but maybe one person is very precise and they annotate every single little litter piece while others maybe disregard the litter pieces and just label the big pieces of trash. Both of them could be right, but this has to be covered in the instructions to say, do we label every small, minute, little piece of litter or do we just leave them out? Um, so I would say this is the biggest, um, the, the, the biggest mission that we now have to prove that quality is not something that you can just solve by having consensus labeling by two people and taking, you know, uh, the, the median of both, or maybe escalating this to a third arbiter and just making sure that this solves the issue because maybe all three of them are wrong or maybe two are wrong and one is right. So you cannot um, assume that uh, technical fixes like this are actually going to solve the issue. Yeah, I can definitely 
speak to that in my previous life and work as a historian and researcher. I've done a couple of projects which were involved very he heavy text labeling, you know, the sort that I was working eight, nine hours for three, three, four months on each, just labeling things. And firstly, I my idea of categories and the specific cat labels and so on was not completely different necessarily, but definitely was pretty different after seeing, you know, 50,000 examples of the thing versus before, like that's obviously going to be the case. And so I feel like you need to build that in as part of your process. But then also, yeah, the moment you start adding in other people as part of the process, the moment it immediately diverges because everyone has a different idea of what certain things and concepts mean. It's tricky. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And I would say it's, it's tricky because sometimes you also need to know how models work and how they would process the input data so as to make sure that, for example, if we're thinking about um, the litter detection or whatever uh, it is, um, that we go in, in the route that's actually going to be less confusing for the model. Um, so you need both the ML expertise and the actual annotation expertise in order to be able to create solutions that are actually going to be more beneficial and will create less confusion in the data. Um, we spoke a little bit at the top, or you did rather, um, about kind of making sure this is done in an ethical way. Um, and yeah, I know it's definitely clear from your website and from talks and stuff that you've given that you think about this and it's important to build this in. Like, how do you see yourself in the wider space in this regard and kind of what are the ways to make sure this is more of a reality in the data labeling world? Yeah, well, ethical AI is quite a vague concept and now a lot of companies are just labeling themselves as ethical AI companies. Um, but it's the same as impact sourcing, you know, maybe you have some internal measures, but are they actually impactful? So in this case, you know, are, are you actually helping to create ethical AI solutions uh, through your work? So for us, you know, we, we have our entire ethical AI policy that covers a lot of these aspects because it's not just one. So we have... And, you know, we have our fair work policy, which is the first thing in terms of the compensation of labelers and so on. And this is the, the essence of who we are. We also have the client selection and the fact that we do not work with any companies that are developing AI for military purposes, defense purposes, um, you know, uh, critical applications of AI that are also, for example, in the upcoming regulation, they are, these are just labeled as AI that's not permissible yeah. and it's yeah it's it's not good to even be thinking about developing it like I have no AI systems that use manipulation and so on um, so we have that restriction and we also have a client scoring system where we classify different applications of AI from you know AI for good which is a score of four to maybe questionable applications of AI, uh, which need specific permissions from me, for example, in order for us to engage in that, um, for example, uh, applications that have to do with fossil fuels. Um, so we're trying to be very selective in terms of the projects that we support, even though we realize that, it, you know, it, even if we refuse to work with you, you're still going to find another annotation company that's going right. to do the job. But still, for us, it's a matter of, of principle. Um, and then we have um, the entire scoping of the project, the fact that we're going to be working with you to scope the taxonomy and to make sure that it's diverse and it's uh, very uh, aware of different biases that may come across even if, even before starting to label just how you phrase the taxonomy. Like, are you segmenting, are you, for example, categorizing people in, gen in terms of gender and race? How do you even phrase these categories? Do you have like male and female? Do you have uh, man, woman, and non-binary? Do you have an other class? Do you have just like a uh, maybe a zero and one continuum where people can choose where in the continuum the person is? Why are you even labeling gender and race? Uh, you know, all of these questions that need to be discussed even before the labeling process, we're there to support our clients with that and to flag some potential issues. Um, and then, of course, structuring the labeling process, uh, making sure that the annotators who are going to be working on the data are diverse, uh, especially when it has to do with different um, AI that's meant to be used in different locations and so on. 
Um, in terms of data set collection, which we have done in the past as well, um, these are usually very custom projects and you have to design them with a lot of care because annotation is quite easy compared to actually going out and collecting data. Uh, and there you have to deal with uh, consent, with privacy and so on. Um, so we've taken a great deal of care in designing these projects and making sure that people are aware of you know, why are they submitting images of themselves or, you know, whenever they're taking images of maybe like objects or documents and so on. Uh, what do we do with personal data on these images and so on. Um, so there are a lot of, yeah, areas in which we're working. As I mentioned, we're also thinking about data set documentation and actually making sure that whenever we are collecting a data set, uh, there is a document saying, okay, these are the classes, this is the distribution, these are the interdependencies. Uh, this is how it was collected. These are the instructions that people refer to when collecting so that this can be traced back. We know whenever there is an issue, people can actually use it um, to go back and, and find what created the issue. Um, and of course, just raising awareness within our team. We have our ethical AI training for our core team, which is basically a distilled version of our policy so that everyone can learn it. And we also have an ethical AI training for our annotators which was quite interesting to develop just because they're, you know, a lot of people don't have a clear understanding of why they're labeling these pictures. Like, why do you want me to draw boxes around all of these cars on the image? Some of them are simply fine with that. They're like, okay, you know, I'm just going to label what you tell me to label and I'm going to receive my money and I don't want to complicate my life uh, with further reflections on what that is used for. But we do have labelers who are very curious and they're excited to be part of this and, uh, you know, they've been asking, you know, what is going to happen with our jobs? Are they also going to be automated? You know, these questions that you and I are discussing, they're also worried and they're saying, okay, what's going to happen? I'm seeing that this client's model is now improving and they're not needing my input anymore. So am I going to lose my job? Um, so we also are trying to raise awareness among our uh, annotators about their own judgment, what it means, their own biases. Uh, their role in the AI industry and so on. Mm -hmm. So I imagine you've had a lot of opportunity working with lots of different places to try out lots of different annotation tools. I'm kind of curious, what are the tools that you're excited about and or if you get the choice, like you would definitely use it for computer vision tasks or whatever? Yeah, so this is actually something that has been part and parcel of our model since we started. We decided not to build an annotation tool of our own, but rather to use what's available on the market and partner with a lot of these tools. Um, and it, the market has really exploded. There are so many annotation tools out there. Um, and we have actually been publishing a regular series on our website called uh, our favorite annotation tools. We have the best yep. tools of like 20. I would recommend people, people check that out. Yeah. So, yeah. so you know, we're, we're just trying to give, it's not like, it's not paid promotion or anything. It's just like our honest feedback on these tools. And I think, you know, this has been a, a big part of our contribution and also, you know, just sharing our expertise as a company that has been using a lot of these tools very regularly. Um, I would say that, you know, I'm, I'm very excited about uh, open source tools that, you know, may have an enterprise version, but that have a lot of, that give anyone the ability to label data as they wish. I think that there is a big trend towards making uh, tools open source, at least, you know, their, their core version. Uh, like for example, Label Studio, they're doing a great job. Um, I'm very excited about Hasty AI. They have been doing a lot of really, really good work in terms of uh, automation, in terms of training models in the backend that can actually uh, automate a lot of the work that you're doing. They have an automated um, error finder as well that uh, they're using the model trained in the back end to spot errors in your labeling. Um, so they're, they've been doing really, really uh, good work. Um, and then who else? Maybe some of the new tools. I'm seeing that there are a lot of tools that are very specialized. For example, for medical AI, there are a lot of tools that are specifically meant to be used for DICOM imagery um, and you know specific applications like these. Uh, which also for us is great because 
we are so flexible that whenever a client comes and they say, I want to label Dicom images, we can pick the best, you know, most specialized tool for them and say, okay, this is the perfect tool for you. It supports all of your formats and so on. Yeah. Um, but I would say uh, a lot of the tools that we're currently using there, most of them are still open source. You know, for example, for medical imagery, we were using 3D Slicer, uh, which is just, you know, this offline desktop application uh, for labeling images. And it just has so many uh, great, great features that not a lot of these SaaS platforms are able to provide. Um, and there is a trade-off because when you're using this type of, of um, offline tool, you don't have any project management capabilities, user management, and so on. You have to resort to very manual you know, exchanges of data. Um, but very frequently, we've had to use that tool just because it offered the best functionalities um and kind of yeah uh just just do it the the most traditional way in terms of distributing the work and afterwards getting the files by the annotators and so on yeah i was really surprised looking into the kind of the most latent latest iteration of all of these tools and definitely for the closed source kind of platform type options i was surprised just how expensive they were like my mind was almost blown like how expensive they are i guess like someone is making money from that it's hard to see given how many of them there are i think it may be maybe uh, the the vc pressure because a lot of these are now venture backed and funded so of course there is a big pressure on them to make a lot of money through the platform but i agree that uh, a lot of them are are quite expensive considering that you also have to pay for the labor for the annotation for example right right yeah and hopefully i mean definitely the trend towards open source or hopefully just like some really solid open good open source options that's really great and maybe some consolidation as well as the field develops um, most probably yeah but the truth is that i'm also saying that still a lot of our clients especially the big ones they're just building their in-house platforms just because they have particular protocols that have to be followed particular ways in which they want their data to be labeled. They want to keep everything in house um, mm. and not deal with like tr the transfer of data and so on. Um, so this is something that um, it, it's kind of this hidden part of the market just because they may be reaching out to some of these platforms, trying them out and then just borrowing some ideas for their in-house tool. Right. Uh, but, but there is a big part of the market, maybe, I don't know, 30, 40% of companies are just using their in-house tools that they've created. Okay, interesting. I hadn't expected so much. And I guess finally, before we get to the to, to the last two que smaller questions, I'm interested like about the just the, the tech space in Bulgaria, like how that is, like where do you fit as part of it? I don't really have any sense of that. Yeah, I mean, it's growing. Uh, it's great because Bulgaria until recently was more like a near sourcing uh, destination for just outsourcing IT uh, services development, uh, IT development services, and so on. And we have uh, this big industry of call centers and DPOs. Uh, but now a lot of these service companies are going into the product space. Um, so it's been actually very hard to try to find technical talent because it's uh, you know such a competitive market. There are a lot of companies that are hiring. Uh, but it, it, it's definitely growing, which is great. Um, and I would say, yeah, we we are already quite known here locally in Bulgaria just because the ecosystem is still quite small. Um, and I think we're not completely a member of the tech space and also we're not completely a member of the NGO kind of like social workspace. We're kind of in between. And, um, you know, we're an interesting spe specimen, I, uh, I guess. Um, but we've, we've received a lot of support from the local community, both from the NGO side and like uh, big institutions that have tried to support our work and endorse it. And also from the tech companies. Our first client was a Bulgarian computer vision company, and they've been our uh, supporters and mentors ever since. Um, so we've, we've definitely re received a lot of help and support. Great, great. So we usually end these podcasts with a couple of quick questions that you can answer however you are. I've slightly adapted them to, to, to your particular case. So the first of which, like, what would be a quick win that someone someone building models or someone in the ML space could 
add to make their annotation more robust? Um, I would say a, a sheet with examples. Just sit down, annotate some images, see what examples come out, see what are the edge cases. This is something that you can do in an hour or two, but it's going to save so much work and back and forth with the annotators. So it's a very, very quick way. Mm -hmm. Great tip. And what, especially since you've interacted so much with the tooling space, like what's one part of the annotation and labeling process that you feel needs to be given more attention by people building tools? Mm, I would say data set collection is still a part that is not uh, addressed enough because also a lot of companies need very custom solutions. Um, mm -hmm. But if there was an easy way for companies to get access to data sets um, or to collect data sets uh, from around the world, I think this would be quite interesting because a lot of companies now are having to come up with very uh, complex and internal solutions and a lot of tools are focusing on the annotation part. Um, so the, the first collection stage is it's still not addressed completely. Well, thank you very much for coming on. I'm sure our listeners learned a lot about annotation and hopefully when they think about MLOps now, they'll also include annotation as part of the workflow. Yeah, I hope so too. Thank you so much for the invitation. And uh, yeah, whoever is listening, feel free to get in touch with me, ask questions. I'm always happy to uh, discuss and exchange ideas. Thank you for listening to this latest episode of Pipeline Conversations. If you enjoyed what you heard, please consider giving us a review wherever you get your podcasts. It helps us get seen by more people. And of course, it's always nice to receive feedback. If you have suggestions for future guests, please send them over to podcast and zenml.io. Thanks. Until next time.